into our simulated mo uh, battery model, and this generates uh, the typical behavior for the, uh, for the battery uh, for these missions. Uh, here we're um, focusing on the final uh, phase of the, the mission, which is the lunar phase, and we can see from the current and the voltage uh, profiles that uh, the, the battery will reach about 15 amps discharge and a minimum voltage of about 24 volts, noting that the minimum and maximum uh, uh, voltage and current are 20 volts and 15 amps. You can see that at the beginning of life, uh, the battery will reach these limits, and therefore, uh, for the final phase of the mission, if uh, capacitating and string failure are accounted for, uh, the battery will not provide the, the power for this uh, phase, so the power budget needs to be revised. I'm going to pass over to Ollie, which will explain the battery mechanical part. So, um, last year's team was focused on ana analyzing a 7S 4P battery, but like Andre said, after re-evaluating the power budget, it was increased to an 8S 10P battery. So this is the full working cab model provided to us by ABSL um, of the 8S 10P battery. Um, so the mechanical analysis basically starts by constructing a structural model. This entails removing all the unnecessary complicated details, um, such as manufacturing tolerances shown here, or bolt holes shown here, which is modeled using split lines. Uh, um, so the aim of the structural model is to reduce the computational time by simplifying it and reducing the number of elements and nodes within the model itself. So after we've made the structural model, we have to compile a mass budget report, and this is basically um, compiling a list of all the items in the full working cab model, their weights, and then um, adjusting the densities using the volumes that are provided by the SOLIDWORKS simulation, so that the structural model has the same overall mass as the actual full working model, which is approximately 4.1 kilograms. So the, the simulations start with the linear dynamic random vibration analysis, um, and so here are the responses in the x, y, and z axes, uh, and the graphs show the power spectral density versus the frequency. Uh, the black line here shows the input profile provided by SSTL, um, and the other lines represent four sensors placed on the battery during simulation. So one in the center of the cell brick, one on the constrained foot where the base excitation is applied, one to the corner, and one to the opposite corner. And this shows the, the first. Uh, resonant frequency of the battery in that axis. So here are some one meter stress plots of the random vibration in those axes, peak RMS um, values that were um, obtained using calculations. And we use those to scale the next simulation, which is the 1G static study. And the 1G static study, we're basically looking at, we're concerned about the displacement of the battery casing. And the objective is to, to observe a battery casing displacement of less than a millimeter. Um, so here there'll be X, Y, and Z um, axes. And the final part of the analysis is concerned with um, analysing the bulk hole stress calculation. So, like I mentioned earlier, we model it using split lines. We probe them in the analysis, we average them, to, and then we average them to find the, the bulk hole stress in the eight feet. And then for fail-safe worst case, we simulate one failing and we remove the constraint and we see if the, if the other seven bulk will be able to take the, the redistributed load. And so the objective of this is to observe it as being less than the yield strength of the aluminium. So I'd like to pass over to Will, who's going to talk to you about the PCDU. So we've already heard about the um, solar array and the battery. So the PCD is a piece of custom hardware which was produced and built by the Warwick EPS team. And its function is to tie together the solar array with the battery and the other team's subsystems which use the power. It consists of three main parts. The solar array regulation takes power from the solar arrays and is capable of charging the battery. The load protection protects the EPS from a fault which could occur in, a, in another subsystem. And the power management unit here um, uh, monitors the health of the system and reports back to the onboard computer via the handbooks. The main focus for the third year, for this year's team, was de determining the best form of solar array regulation we could use and developing a, a thermal model of the PCU. So, as Louise has already mentioned, solar arrays aren't a very um, common type of power source. Just to recap, they estimate a constant current source to start with, but after a certain voltage, 
if you have available current drops off suddenly um, to eventually to zero. And this produces the power curve shown in the dashed lines, which means that the power available changes throughout the whole characteristic. And it's also affected by temperature and the age of the cells. Two methods of solar array regulation, therefore, are used in space. One being sequential switching shunt regulator, or S3R, and the other being maximum power point tracker, or MPBT. This year's team has been doing a trade-off to see which of these will be more suitable for SMO. Shown here are simplified block diagrams for both the two types of solar array regulation. On the right, sequential switching shunt regulator uses a fixed bus voltage, which is maintained at this level using the battery charge regulator, or BCR, and the S3R shunting sections, which are both controlled by the main error amplifier. On the other hand, MPPT, the power bus is directly connected to the battery, which means that the voltage can change over time. DC to DC converters um, are controlled to maintain the solar array voltage near the maximum power point. So, the main advantages of these, the two are listed here. MPPT is a highly modular design, so it's very re uh, resistant to, re to failures, and the power is extracted at the maximum power point. S3R extracts power extremely efficiently, but it's very rarely at its maximum power point, and also it's very complex design to make redundant. A fuller list of the advantages are given in the handout, but since the reliability is such an issue for ESMO, we decided that MPPT would be the more suitable option. So I'll now pass it on to James, who will describe the work we've done in designing and prototyping an MPPT system. Okay, so um, once we've decided to use the MPPT, we uh, had to prototype it. So um, our MPPT circuit incorporates a boost DC-DC circuit. Um, this produces a higher output voltage than is available to it on the input voltage. Um, and it lets it control the ratio between the output and input voltage by monetizing the duty cycle um, on a power MOSFET in the circuit. Um, with this, together with the fact that the output voltage of a battery fixes the output voltage of the MPPT circuit, means that we can vary the input voltage um, and consequently uh, move around the solar array ID characteristic and get uh, maximum power or whatever power we choose. Um, this here shows the boost circuit um, which most of our designs are based on. Um, so our circuit also incorporates two algorithms, um, Sturm and Reserve, which essentially modifies the duty cycle in order to maximize the power uh, available to us from the solar arrays, and a constant voltage algorithm, which is used when uh, the battery is uh, fully charged and we don't want to extract maximum power from the solar arrays anymore. Now, ultimately, we want to incorporate all of this into a microcontroller. However, during prototyping, we found it was much easier to use um, the lab environment. This here shows our lab virtual instrument, um, which let us modify the algorithm, modify use cycles, and collect data from the uh, MPPT prototype of the circuit. And um, it allowed us to interface, and we could interface to a circuit via a data acquisition instrument provided to us by National Instruments. Um, so, as well as the equipment I've just talked about, to test the circuit, we also had a solar array simulator, uh, which we built, uh, which copies the characteristics of an actual solar array. Um, also, we uh, put together a battery out of some commercially available Lithium ISL. Um, once we went to this, we could then uh, test the circuit. So uh, up here we have a uh, battery voltage versus time um, chart, which shows the battery as it was charging. Um, at first, we have a constant current phase, which Mark talked about earlier. And we have a short transition followed by a constant voltage section. Um, the constant voltage section shows about shows a variation of about one percent from the maximum. And uh, these different lines show the effect of the duty cycle switching. Uh, finally, um, the efficiency chart is shown here. And it shows that uh, up, to a, up to a duty cycle of 0.58, we have an efficiency of uh, greater than 87%. And uh, we hope to get this higher up as we uh, improve the as we put this prototype onto a PCB and uh, improve the layout. Uh, I'll now pass it on to Adam, who will be talking about the thermal analysis of the PCB. Thank you very much, James. So here we have the piece of the UK uh, it, It's going to be located in the avionics stack. It's going to take up two microtrays. The top microtray will be the PMU, the power management unit. 
is going to contain auxiliary electronics which will interface directly through a CAN node and they will not be of particular thermal interest because they will not generate much heat. Our solar array regulation units will be the MPPTs, so they will be the, the inefficiencies of which will generate 20 watts throughout the uh, actual system. Now, um, we have, here we have our first model, a reduced two-node model. Um, all of the heat will be generated at the PCB, and it will be transferred directly through conduction through to the case. Now, the PCB will be a very low uh, thermal conductivity, 0.25 watts per meter Kelvin, and the case will be a very high thermal conductivity, uh, 1 point, 166 watts per meter Kelvin. So, first of all, our, our model shows with a, a very simple distributed heat generation across the whole PCB, there'll be a very small temperature difference between the two layers. Uh, but of course, in reality, uh, there will not actually be a, a uniform distributed heat generation. In reality, we'll have individual components, as noted on the prototype. Now, if we were to take a very similar layout to what was indicated on the prototype, we would see that uh, we have something like this. When you put the high-powered MOSFET components towards the middle, uh, they are not uh, the heat doesn't really have anywhere to go uh, because it's trapped sort of on the PCB, and it will just get stuck. So in a steady-state model such as this one, you have an interface temperature of 293 Kelvin and a maximum temperature all the way up at 573 Kelvin. So clearly something needs to be done to actually distribute this heat and take it away towards the size of the case and actually towards the boundary plate. So what we've done here is rearrange the MPPTs into a, a sort of modular format. Um, so, uh, sorry, it's maintaining the modular format. So what we've done is actually just cha change the layout so, they, so the high power components move towards the edge and actually distribute their heat towards the case and then towards the rest of the avionic stack and the rest of the satellite. Uh, it's important to uh, make sure that this model will satisfy the electronic uh, requirements for the uh, MPPTs. Now, so to conclude the whole of the project this year then, uh, just a very brief summary for you. So the solar arrays have shown that the thermal models achieve a good agreement with each other and it's ready to progress to the next stage of design. The battery has, uh, has shown the power budget will actually need to be reviewed uh, in order to uh, fit the requirements for ESMO because there is not a... Uh, the battery is, is a fixed mass, it's a fixed battery being provided with and it will not, under the worst case of the situation, provide sufficient power for the satellite with the current budget. Uh, the vibration analysis performed uh, also validates, at least performs, the first vital steps towards validation. And finally, uh, the PCU and uh, MPBT structure was chosen over S3R because uh, it is a, it's most suitable for us to produce. A uh, prototype was built uh, to a high level of efficiency as expected. And finally, thermal uh, models were produced to actually uh, find constraints towards an optimum layout of the uh, MPBT system. So our next steps on the ESMO project are working towards critical design and then final design, build and testing of the satellite. Thank you very much and have enjoyed the rest of your day.